There must be spiders in the interweb because we're having all kinds of fun trouble here today. Well, that's what live is all about, is it? Uh, welcome to the Nutmeg Tavern. We are live and we're going to have fun talking about bread in the 18th century and other wonderful questions. Lots of stuff to cover today. I've been gone. I wasn't here on this Friday or even the Friday before. Oh, it's been terrible. Uh, I've missed you guys. I've missed being able to come into the Nutmeg Tavern, rub elbows and say hey and all that good stuff. Um, so we don't, I, I'm not joined behind the bar by Ryan and he is taking, uh, he's taking some time off with his family. So I've got to tend the bar by myself. So I made a nice um, cup of oolong tea. Uh, excellent stuff and boy, just a little bit of nutmeg. Sets it right off. Uh, behind the console, battling the spiders in the interweb, is Aaron. Hey, everyone. So, here's what we need to do. If that other chat is still a thing, copy this link into that chat and let them know that we're over here. I don't know what happened. Basically, it ended our stream, and I had to start a whole new live stream, separate link. So if there's still people chilling over in that other one, send this to them or at least let them know that we are streaming at this other link or this link is working fine. I don't know. I have no idea what ha what just happened. But yeah. So you enjoyed your time off. I really enjoyed my time off. Uh, fresh, refreshed, and uh, ready to get back to making lots of fun videos and you know we've got the brick burning coming up and then we got some cooking episodes coming up and so uh, a lot of fun stuff and I really um, for all you patreon folks make sure to watch for a special patreon live stream coming up this week um, so check that out yeah. watch for it we're yeah. gonna make that happen and thanks to everyone who watched the brick making video. We really appreciate the the other com the comments and all the yeah. that we had so much fun making that video and I had fun editing it and yeah. all that stuff. It was yeah. it was a great turned out and if, great. And if you're a member or a Patreon person, you you can check out that behind the scenes video which everyone enjoyed. So that you get to see a little bit of that um, that special shot with the Anyway, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So bread making in the 18th century, one of the reasons why I picked this topic, uh, because really just recently, just in the last couple of days, we received this book, which I'm super excited about being able to offer. This is our reprint version of a treatise on the art of bread making. This is 1804, very early 18th century, in fact. I mean, if you're publishing something in 1804, you've been gathering that information for a decade or whatever. So we know this is what late 18th century bread making is like. And not just that, but what the scientific minds of bread making are, uh, you know, what scientific minds are thinking about bread making in that time period. And I mean, even thinking about the scientific thought in this time period is really important because this 18th century time period, uh, time period, a lot of people ask, why do you study the 18th century? Well, that's when we get this shift of people uh, and they really start to think scientifically, the age of reason and all this empirical knowledge stuff. Well, there's a lot of that in this where he's studying and talking about baking bread, not just, hey, you know, this is what happens in a very generic sense, but very, very specifically, what's happening? What do we believe is happening with wheat? What do we believe is happening with yeast? How should you bake your, make your bakehouse? What are the other kinds of grains we can make bread with? And why would we do that? And what's the cost difference? And you know, all this, which is tremendous information. Before I talk about the contents of this and some specific little notes I want to talk about, we've got pictures of bread in the 18th century, right? Let's take a look at some slides. Oh, I was going to print this guy out. Darn. Um, <laughs> so this is a uh, political cartoon from the very late 18th century, um, right there in the 1790s. 
there is a there is a, a a crop failure in England and the cost of bread skyrockets so that people can't eat it and so these this is a this is a making fun of these uh, rich people in government saying, oh, you know, all these people are rebelling. We can fix them. We'll give them a substitute. We'll tell them about substitutes for bread. It's like, oh, yeah, eat um, yeah, venison or roast beef. You can eat chicken or turtle soup or fish or, you know, ragouts, you know, drink burgundy and champagne. Uh, so they're talking about uh, replacing this food for the poor, simple inexpensive food with horribly expensive foods uh so it's you know it's like that that's that's not viable at all so uh people were very unhappy with that that whole kind of thing like french revolution right exact same time period uh let them eat cake they can't afford bread oh let them eat cake uh same thing going on a lot of still lifes were available uh, or uh, were were um being painted of food in the 17th and 18th century so these are always fun when you when you want to study food in the time period um, this is dutch i mean the the glass there is a dutch glass that um that uh, black forest uh, glass work there and we see um, seafood and we see some fruit and and then there's that classic classic loaf of bread i think this is so great that you know, there's bread from 300, 350 years ago, and if we saw that loaf in the artisan, you know, in the artisan bakery section, we'd say, "Yep, oh, I know exactly what that is." Um, beautiful loaf of bread. Uh, again, an early painting. You can tell by the boy's clothes. Uh, he has a whole basket full of interesting kinds of bread. Just like today, we have all these different kinds of uh, bread, different loaf shapes and types, and, and they had exactly the same thing going on. So we got these cool bread sticky looking things and some round bread pieces. And uh, uh, there's some, you know, you can see that kind of cookie breads that are in there um, and standard small loaves. Again, super early. This might even be late 16th century. This is a a little crop in of a much bigger picture and it's full a full of food um uh you know there's a hare a giant <laughs> rabbit there on one side check out right by her elbow these huge wheels of cheese i don't know what that one is it's like dark green that's got to be the craziest cheese in the world i would love to find out what that tastes like and what we'll go oh, back sorry, to that sorry. there she is and there there's a little loaf of bread right underneath the cheese this even the fact that that loaf of bread is small and it's white that is expensive bread like all the other foods shown in the picture it's high class food a small loaf and it's white next um yeah here's another one of these still lifes um and it's a bit of a crop in and we see that beautiful classic classic loaf of bread there sitting on a giant wheel of cheese and so often in some of these food paintings we have a pest in the side we got the mouse over there or a small rat either a giant mouse or a small rat not like those chicago rats you guys saw <laughs> that one time oh man that's a that's a tale for another day <laughs> next uh again this is a fairly early painting this is probably late 17th century and uh you know there's people there's food there it's probably a celebration again because that loaf of bread it's almost a bun it's small it's white uh there aren't a lot of loaves of bread there um and we see the the you know like giant cabbages on the ground and a parsnip and like you could trip and stub your toe on that thing um it's a lot very interesting that there isn't a lot there but there is that one little loaf of bread this is an allegory painting and it's uh it's a it's a juxtaposition between rich and poor there's the poor man to one side his clothes are ragged he's got no hat he's got nothing in his hands and there's the other the rich man and he has bread lots of different kinds of bread he's got that fancy 
bread there in his hand that looked like a hamburger hamburger bun. That is that that classic uh, small loaf of bread, very white in the inside. There's darker loaves on one side. Um, he's got those little finger uh, pieces of bread. Those are probably almost like uh, you know almost like cookies. And then this, I, I, this, we see this in another painting too, I think we'll see that interesting collapsed bread that's like a bowl. Um, I'm not real familiar. So if you're familiar with that style of bread, give me, a, give uh, Aaron a, a, a comment in the chat. I'd like to know more about that. And it's just not, I just noticed it today. And it's like, oh, I don't have time to research that, but I'll bet one of you guys out there recognizes that in a second. Go ahead. Man, that is that's a big loaf of bread. It's it's rising right out of its, you know, uh, it probably has a giant air pocket. <laughs> um, but this is a meal right here. Uh, if we look at some of the like primitive cookery, they talk about simple meals. This is a meal. There's bread, there's cheese, there's wine. That's it. Um, and a full meal at that. Go ahead. Yeah, another little fishes maybe they're smelts or something maybe they're pickled like pickled the ones we smelt, did yeah, yeah got to be good got to be good uh vinegar to pour on them probably not not wine and then the biggest fly yeah. i have ever seen i don't know what that thing is Demon it's probably fly. gonna carry that bread loaf off it's so huge <laughs> go ahead um that that loaf in the middle there looks like it's got a little scorched um Real typical of bread in that time period. It's hard to bake it without getting it a little burnt. And they would they would scrape, they would rasp off the outside of the bread. If it got burnt, no problem. Hey, we're not going to throw that bread out. We're going to rasp off the burnt parts and send it right out. It's like when you do toast, you know, and you burn it and you scrape it. And same thing, same thing. We've got candies there. Those little white things up there are candies and... Uh, pickles and cheese on one side and I don't know if this is sliced bread down here in the lower right hand corner um, yeah, figs like man we got lots of stuff in that one more uh, cheese and a small loaf of bread that looks like it's been buttered and we've got something that looks like ship's biscuits uh, there on the one side you can break your teeth on those go ahead uh, another s simple meal that's probably a jug with just water in it, tumbler to drink the water out of, the bread, small loaf, there's sausage there that we can see sliced into, and nuts, a simple, simple, typical meal. Uh, this is one of those famous, you know, tavern paintings from the 18th century. And she's got, again, one of those little manchet loaves. Those little, they look like hamburger buns. That is a loaf of bread. High in bread right there. Uh, again, he's eating a simple meal. He's got a, little things on the plate there. It looks like fried eggs even. Maybe, maybe scrambled. Go ahead. We got a couple of bakers, paintings of bakers. See that loaf of bread that I was talking about earlier with the rich and poor? She's holding up a smaller version of that same sort of collapsed loaf, a whole, whole basket of them right there. And those little tiny manchet loaves and a big loaf there that poor, poor folks food was usually a big giant coarse loaf with like rye and other grains in it. Uh, and that fancy bread loaf that's standing up there, and he's done a load of pretzels, and he's got more of those little loaves in the back. Great painting. And this guy, he is a troublemaker. He's a troublemaker. <laughs> I can tell just by the look in his eye. <laughs> Again, poor, poor bread there, the big loaf, uh, pretzels, smaller loaves, fancy loaves there on the sideboard. Uh, pretzels hanging from a special pretzel holder. We need more of those kinds of shops, don't we? There we are, back to the beginning. Amazing paintings! Before I get to the book, I got a bunch of Patreon names. Uh, I didn't do Patreon last time we did a live stream because I forgot. Um, and now I've got this 
list that goes on and on and on. So we got to break this up a little bit. Brand new Patreons. Uh, did I check that one? Hold on a second. Wait. And, um, yeah. That The link to that book is in the description box, yes. and I'm putting it in the chat. Yes, yes. Thank you, Aaron. Yep. Brand new, brand new, brand new Patreon folks that I haven't uh, talked about, and I'll do half of these. We'll stop right there. Uh, Sarah Mackey, Jesse, Ateris Freeze, I think is the name, Craig Beatty, Azula Akima, Rick Skinner, Michael Pastori, somebody's just Peter, uh, Georgiana Bell, Santa Sapila. Hopefully I got that right. There is one here. Uh, I've got to uh, double check on that one. I'm going to write a circle around that one. Um, Patreon didn't come up with the name, so maybe they didn't want their name read out or or maybe their name is blank. I don't know, but I'll double check on that. Dan Morris. Then someone's, that's just Davis. Uh, we have another one that is Quicksilver. Cheyenne uh, Lujano. Maybe. Um, and Zach Dillinger. Um, again, all new people. We'll get to a few more. I got so I got so much stuff to catch up on. Um, but that's good. Let me let me cover this book. Or did you have a question or two for me before well, I get could, to this? Maybe we could do. I have a couple super chats real quick. And yeah, one or two questions. Let's do we'll it. Do those real quick. Let's do it. So first super chat is from uh, Denise Maloney Pyron. Thank yes. you. John, someone seems to have blocked me from commenting on your videos. Please have someone look into it. Uh, Ryan Mercer, thank you. A Tuesday episode, I'll take it. Yep. And then Ryan Mercer became a member. And thank David you. Nelly, I think, became a member again because his logo is one of the... New. Like, yeah. The, uh, okay. You've been a member for a while. Ah, right? So thanks, everyone. Yeah. Um, Denise, I will look into that. It's weird because you're able to comment yeah. in here and stuff. And you're obviously not a blocked user or anything. So I don't know. I'll have to... I'll have to dig into that. Sorry we'll about shake that. shake YouTube and make it. Yeah. Work. We'll write a le an angry letter <laughs> and it'll get there in two months. <laughs> um, so as far as questions, I think this one question is, um, it seems kind of broad and it mm -hmm. seems kind of hyperbolic, but I also kind of like it. Okay. It's like, would you say bread is the most important food ever made? Bread, most important food ever made. I obviously think that's a little extreme, but you know what? I, like, well, uh, I think the I think the painting said it in some ways, and other things, um, you know, other things give a hint to that 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 concept of bread. Um, it shows up in you know so many different cultures, even the biblical references to bread. Um, how it's talked about in that when, when the thing started out when the the picture started out and and it was a it was a it was a comical um you know reference to how the government was uh kind of dealing with bread shortages and there were riots there were bread riots in the time period um uh it, i think it goes to saying uh, about how important bread was for everyone um, and especially poor people in the time period. Uh, so I would almost have to answer yes um, to that because bread is so massively important to the populace um, at large. I, I don't have, uh, I don't think I've got um, the primitive cookery book. You know, and I talked about those simple meals and sometimes he said, it's like water and bread, yeah. Sometimes that's what your meal is. I mean, we joke about that, bread and water, like prison food, right? Um, but there were some people, they subsisted on nothing but inexpensive bread. Yeah, I just got a super chat from, um, I think it's Noctilus Am Amateur, and they remind us that nutmeg is more important than bread. I'm so sorry that we slipped up. <laughs> um, another question is, how was brain blah, how was bread made from non grain products in the 18th century in North America? Non grain products or just not from wheat? That would be my question there. Um, so, I mean, we we uh, and we'll talk about that. In fact, there's a whole chapter in 
ye old art of bread making. Let me see if I can find the chapter. Now it it's you know it mainly talks about their corn and corn just means grain in Great Britain at the time period and usually the corn is wheat. Uh, we are, uh, but there's this whole, where did it go? Gosh, it's hiding from me. Ah, yes. On the substitutes for wheat and bread. He spends a whole chapter talking about, well, if I don't have wheat or if wheat's too expensive because that crop fails, what are we going to make? What are we going to make our bread from? And uh, there's barley, there's potatoes, there's uh, buckwheat, which is not a wheat at all. It's actually like uh, rhubarb seeds, you know, it's, it's a really interesting grain. Um, rye, and then we have, he talks about uh, rice. He talks about maize, which is in North America what we call corn. Um, hominy, same thing. Right, so a bunch of those things. And then how to mix them. What happens if we mix maize and wheat and potatoes together? Um, you know, lots of stuff on, uh, on those kinds of things. So the only thing that's mentioned here that isn't a grain, wait a minute, huh? no, I'm, see, I'm wrong again. Uh, potato flour, da 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 da. Uh, boiled yams, plantains, uh, figs, acorn bread really interested in that. Chestnut bread, turnip bread, cassava bread. There you go. Those are all the ones that he's listing and he's being very, you know, uh, thorough in his uh, bread contact or bread information here. Um, so I was going to say the only one here that wasn't a grain uh, was potatoes, but of course we then, then he comes up with these other ones. Um, Yams, plantains, figs, out of dates. How are you going to make bread out of, I mean, you're going to end up with, well, sounds, fig, fig newtons, like some, right? We got, a, we got some recipes to Yeah, we got some, we got some cooking to do. That's <laughs> for sure. Uh, and I really want to spend some time on the acorn bread here. Um, chestnuts, turnips, cassava. Um, he's covering it all. He, although he doesn't, I don't think, talk about breadfruit. And again, that's right here in this time period. Um, Midwest Miniman with a donation. Thank you. Love the new mug. Will it come signed like the berries and cream mug I bought a couple oh. of weeks ago? Mm, so I don't have one. I was going to bring one up. I don't know if they, we ran out of them already. We got a small supply of... It's too hard for me to reach over there. Um, Which one is it? No, no, it's all right. Okay. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a blue like the blueberries and cream except it's got red over the top instead of white and it's got the throwback townsend's logo uh a small quantity of those came in so i wasn't even going to bother to bring them into the live stream um and i don't sign the throwback logos i only sign the nutmeg tavern mugs so uh that one will not come signed but you will enjoy it anyway yeah i mean those they sell out pretty quick yeah yeah um uh, yeah Lori harding thank you I am Hopi or Hoppy, I'm not sure. Yeah, Hopi. H -O Hopi, okay. And we bake trays and trays of bread for ceremonial purposes. Mm -hmm. We use a bread oven similar to the one that you built. That's yeah. awesome. Yes. Speaking of bread oven, we got yeah. cool stuff. Coming. That's right on the... That's on, yeah, right on, schedule, on yeah. the schedule. <laughs> uh, Wendy Carr, thank you. I made bread from the yeasty liquid from the bottom of the ginger beer pot. It yeah. made a very tasty bread. That's that oh, whole. Yeah. That's an yeah. awesome process. Using the, the brewer yeast, and the baker. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. right. We were even talking about how that you know that those two they go hand in hand, brewer, baker, and all that kind of stuff. Do you want a couple more questions, or is there anything else you wanted to? Oh, I've got more in this book. You ready for? I'll do. I'll do some more in this book. Let's okay. Do it. Yep. So, such so uh, there's there's uh, chapter two observations on the mealing trade. In other words, who's grinding this wheat? So there's a whole chapter on wheat <laughs> and how they deal with that. Um, and there was this section about storing storing wheat, and he talked about these people storing wheat in in different areas, uh, making granaries. Now this is 18th century. So making granaries six stories high. That's like crazy high for the 18th century. Um, and then uh, uh, in some, let me see, is this it? Oh, yes. In certain parts of the continent, 
of Europe, uh, instead of throwing the corn about with shovels, which was talked about uh, earlier, it's like, how do we how do we clean this corn? Well, we just throw the corn, we throw the wheat around and the stuff drops out. And, um, instead of throwing the cor uh, corn about with shovels uh, from one side of the floor to the other, as is practiced in this country, they turn it out and winnow it frequently and pour it through a trough or mill hopper from one floor to another. So they're they're doing this um, gravity thing. Uh, thus being aired and preserved from all impurities for a space of two years and having all its heat and moisture exhaled, it is lodged in pits. And the heap, being covered with quicklime, is afterwards sprinkled over with a small quantity of water, which causes the grain to shoot to the depth of two or three inches, he talks about sprouting. He's sprouting the wheat and encloses it with an incrustation through which neither air nor insects can penetrate. The pit is afterwards covered up with strong planks and joined together, and in this way the corn may be preserved for 50 or even 100 years. Okay, <laughs> I, it's like okay. I'm trying to I'm trying to you know connect these two. It's like I imagine if you've made a pit. Now I I don't get the sprouting of it, and I don't think he means that the sprouting happens through the whole batch of grain. But I think what happens is is they make this pit. They put the the uh, or a, you know a big wooden barrel or whatever. And they put the quick lime on the lime on the top, and they wet the quick lime, and it turns to limestone is what it does. It doesn't do it instantly, but it reacts with the oxygen in the air and it creates limestone. Uh, so it's like putting a stone cover on it, right? Um, and then they co cover it over with wood. And apparently probably that first little bit of grain sprouts because it gets wet from that top layer. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, hey, we'll just have to try it and then open it up 50 years later. Uh, yeah, it says, and this part was great. So you've you've got the grain, it's all dry, uh, and then it says, uh, number 10, in this circumstance, uh, worthy of, uh, it is a circumstance worthy of observation that a thunderstorm will materially injure corn thus preserved, or thus prepared, and render it for a time perfectly unfit for use. Although it may be dry and fit for grinding, yet after a storm is over, it will be found clammy and sticky. So, don't grind your wheat after a storm. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, right. Right. So, um, there's this whole section on making all that I talked about making um, bread out of other things. Mixed bread. Bread with peas. Uh, bread with potatoes. Uh, let's see. Oh, 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 no. That isn't what I thought it was. Um, then there is... A section here structure of the bakehouse and he talks about what your bakehouse or what your bakery should look like what the building is like how you what kind of uh, well you should have close by and what the uh, what the whole what your dough trough should look like how to make your oven uh, all these just um, you know how it's how it's all done and in fact there's even a kind of a question and answer interview in the appendix um, where he like asks questions of a baker well what do you do for this how much money do you make when you do that uh, and then even in the back of it there is there are tables of what the wheat should cost or if wheat costs this bread should cost that so uh, in the 18th century, much earlier, in fact, he talks about the history of it in here, the sizes of bread are happening in Great Britain, where in certain areas, the government said, uh, a loaf of bread that weighs this should cost that, and it can't cost more than that, and if you, and if you misweigh that, we will punish you. Um, so there's, there's a, a, just, bread is a fascinating and deep topic, and Again, like the one question, it's so, so important to everyday people, all the people um, in the 18th century time period. Um, Black, Black Book Alpha, the book is called A Treatise on the Art of Bread Making. Yes. Here's a link, and it sounds pretty, pretty amazing. 
Yeah, it's um, and this the you know we go and we dig up the texts, we clean them, uh, pick out the ones that are the right kinds of things, and then we you know create an 18th century style. Uh, kind of cover right. for them. This is a paperback cover. It's matte. Uh, but what we do is get 18th century books and we take uh, pictures of the, just exactly the way, you know, the wear of the of the paper and all that. So it's got a cool look to it too. I love, um, I love to have the paper in front of me. You know, you can get the PDF for free if you want. Um, that's cool. But me, I like paper books. So you would say that bread making in the time was pretty regulated. The commercial aspect mm. of making bread was regulated, and and this the aspect of the assizes and some of this um, regulation of it did come over into North America. But it's very you know the where those happen and where they don't. That's oh, it's just it's all mixed up. So it's a very um, localized um, kind of regulation. Mm, yeah, I thought that was interesting because. I think in the time period we feel like oh more freedom and stuff like that but even like in the brick video yeah the government was regulating how you made your bricks and stuff yeah yeah and that's in funny. you know backwater massachusetts in 1635 <laughs> i mean there's like 10 people you know and they're still yep well, we, uh, we got some we got some rules here right yep um here's a here's a cool question um how were grain grinders made in, in the 18th century in North America. Yeah, in North America. So, and that's, you know, it can be tricky. We, um, when things happen, let's kind of work backwards. And what's happening with grinding, say, in the mid 19th century, we've got special roller mills uh, that, that roll the grain and smoosh it uh, between two rollers that are turning in just slightly different um, speeds and that that really is a revolution in, in grinding wheat and that is doing it at a much lower temperature that what doesn't damage the all the nutrients in the grain uh, so there's a lot of different things happening when you and what's I think what most modern mills are actually made like at least in giant you know industrial circumstances there are metal bird, uh, grinders, which have a have two wheels that the that the grain has to go between, and they work back and forth and grind it like uh, a bit like a pe pepper grinder, um, and that again they have metal burrs. They can heat up. They can damage the grain. Most of the grain that's being ground in North America at, in the time period and in Great Britain is being ground on stone grinding wheels. So, you know, it's like you hear about people, a mill wheel being put around their neck and tossed in the ocean, right? Uh, as, a, as a figurative uh, punishment, you know, huge, giant uh, stone wheels made specifically for, for grinding. There's generally the bottom one, which stays solid, and then the upper one, which is turning. I think that's right. Uh, the upper one that's turning, and they're generally uh, there's a hole through the, the the middle of the upper one, so that they can change the amount of pressure that's being applied from the one stone to the next, and you have a have to have a person that comes in and you know makes the the ridges in the grindstone sharp and everything. Um, but stone grinding is amazing. There are some functional stone grinders. It's a great one at Plymouth Plantation uh, in the town. It's not like in the plantation itself, but out of town uh, that has a period style mill. There are m multiple other um, stone mills like that. There's we visited the Y mill. There's a video on that on the uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, those are the mills, and, and are they all water powered, or even some in, even some in North America being wind powered, which is again a classic way of grinding that. And it's great, super super important, super interesting. Oh, so I need to have the whole library here so I can grab it. Uh, <laughs> James Patton's book, which I talked about several uh, live streams ago, he talks about over and over going to the local mill like he would go to a convenience store. Um, he's like, oh, I took, you know, uh, 10 pounds of 
this grain or that grain to be ground, corn or wheat or, or whatever. He goes to the mill and he talks about how he gets, how he pays for it or doesn't pay for it. So many times the, the miller would take a portion of the grain that you would bring, you know, so you would bring in a hundred pounds of wheat to be ground and you would get 95 pounds of flour. That's how he, that's how he got paid. He got a piece of that. And there's more and more and more to talk about about that. <laughs> yeah, I think we should we should do some bread here soon. On the with, on you're gonna wreck cooking. my keto diet, folks. Ah, uh, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get some donations real quick. Um, Harshman Hills, thank you. I was going to do my coin for the bartender, but I guess it goes to John. It'll go to me. <laughs> <laughs> do it double duty. Uh, Luke G, thank you. Were American brewers experimenting with different yeast strains or getting them strictly from bakers? Um, and then Amber Crystal Daughter, I think that's right. Yes. From my hearing yep. Ryan yep. say it. Uh, mostly just chipping in to buy small beer for the labor team at the oh, homestead. yeah. Does this book get into chemical leavening? All right. Thanks, everyone. That's all I got right now. Okay. Chemical. chemical. What was the the question before uh, that? Experimenting with different yeast yeah, strains. Yeah, different, different yeast uh okay let me let me get those real quick and then i've got to do some more patreon and then i have to okay um <laughs> different yeast strains e and the heat the 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 baker gets the yeast from the brewer not the other way around and y you can imagine i think what's happening with yeast in the 18th century is number one it's a trade secret nobody's nobody's talking about exactly where that's from he spends although i didn't i didn't have enough time to read the 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 whole uh chapter of fresh but he spends a whole chapter talking about yeast propagating it uh how to store it how to do all these things which is so important in that time period uh so important for us you know if you're a brewer you get these little packets of yeast make sure to put them in the refrigerator and oh they go bad pretty quick um same thing is happening with yeast in the 18th century how do you store it and so each one of those brewers, he's going to have his own strain of yeast going on. And if he's a good brewer, it's a great. <clears throat> and if he's a bad brewer, bleh, you know, and it makes it makes sour beer and bad bread. Um, chemical leavening talks some about chemical leavening here. Baking bread with carbonic water. <laughs> that sounds great, doesn't it? Um, doesn't spend as much time talking about something like potassium carbonate is what I want him to talk about, but that, because that's happening right there at that time period. But the information isn't getting, it isn't everywhere. Not everyone knows how to do that. He does spend some time talking about using alkalis, probably something like potassium carbonate, taking the sourness out of uh, bread. So he says, oh, I took some, and, he, and it's like experiment one, experiment two. That's what he does in here. Uh, one of the experiments, he takes uh, flour, he takes water, he mix it, he lets it set 36 hours, six and 30 hours is what he says. It gets all sour. It's like vinegar. He puts in this uh, alkali, which is hopefully something like potassium carbonate, and it changes the flavor of the bread. It makes it fluffier. Da, da, da. So, yeah talks about that patreon i could just keep going folks it's really bad it's really bad um the next set of one helpful wonderful thank you so much patreon supporters from this last batch rosie cooper may mulholland uh sabarno lydia howard jeff ferentz chris uh just chris um, John, Jan or Jan uh, Sinkovec, uh, Ascent Comics, Ari Moskowitz, Wesley Heidel, David Melchior, Aaron Sullivan, and a special thanks to Riddle who changed their pledge. Some folks up their pledge again makes it super helpful. Other people, some uh, Patreon is one of those things where you kind of set it up to be a, a, a monthly thing. Uh, some people just want to, boom, one-time gift, the best way to help us out in that kind of one-time thing. Um, there's, uh, there's PayPal. I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, Juan uh, Pacheco. Uh, Les, uh, no, Elizabeth 
Sem Johansson. She's in Norway. Thank you. Uh, and sometimes it's easier. Some things don't work very well in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world. PayPal works most everywhere. So thank you, uh, William Osterheim. Thank you for your kind comment uh, in there. And James Ryan. Again, another great comment that came in. Those are folks that helped us out on PayPal. All these things make a huge difference to us being able to do what we do. Uh, there's a lot of people that make videos happen here. Uh, you know, you always see me, but you don't necessarily always see, you know, Ryan doing the thing he does or, Ron, or Aaron or even Brandon who's working hard right this second. Yep. Um, do you want, I think I'm good with donations right now. Oh, no, here we go. Uh, Kimberly... Sacedo, maybe. Sorry if I'm butchering that. But not about bread, but we love the Bellows episodes. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Oh, Actually, yeah. I put a poll out asking mm -hmm. people what their favorite project so far, and the Forge got by a pretty significant amount the most votes. Yeah, blacksmithing we, and blacksmithing. The Forge. Yeah. yeah, we're really and excited the to, part of that, yeah. to do some more, do some more projects. Yeah, get metal there. hot and beat it with a hammer. Yeah. Love it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um. You want a couple more questions? Sure. So, and here I'm going to delete the ones I've done. Was bread ever used as a type of currency in the 18th century? Some people were paid in food. Uh, actually, beers used more as a currency than bread uh, because it was probably more in demand. Um, but yeah, I think you're going to see that in some circumstances where you know, um, just a simple, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to pay you with, or, or as part of your wages, bread, I'm going to pay you with beer, I'm going to pay you, uh, these kinds of things. Then, then there doesn't have to be as much demand on things like currency, which there was a short, it's like we're dealing with a coin shortage, right? They had a massive coin, sh coin shortage in the time period. So massive that people were counterfeiting small coins that you would think would be ridiculous. It's like counting, you know, counterfeiting $1 bills. They were so in demand. Uh, so though you would, you would, to, you know, say so if you can't get currency, how are you also going to pay people? And sometimes you're going to pay people in bread. Um, David Danelli, thank you. Uh, love the bread live stream. Can't wait for the book. Thank you. Do you. Was coarse flour more commonly used than fine or white flour, or white as? Yeah, so there's uh, there's always been a demand, especially as you go through the time period. The demand grows and grows for white. Uh, white flour, white bread, uh, uh, and there's an issue of um, adulteration. So it's like, oh, we're going to put chalk in there instead, or we're going to use white lead in the bread to make it whiter, or uh, different things that would that would change the color of bread because um, there's a there's a, a demand for white flour, um, and. You know, it's fluffier. Maybe it tastes better. Maybe I don't know. It depends on you know what you're used to, right? Or maybe it's a a, a reaction to the dark, uh, dense loaves that were poor bread. So it's like I'm a poor person. How am I going to show that I'm not a poor person? Well, I'm going to be eating you know a nice, fancy, expensive loaf of bread instead of a chunk off of this bread that looks more like granite uh, than anything else. Uh, John Talley, thank you for the donation. I've been, I've been tinkering around with the kitchen pepper thing. Was mm. there a kitchen pepper type that involved sage, thyme, rosemary, etc.? So the references to kitchen pepper are a bit more, um, you know, the spices that we think of as spices and not herbs. Uh, but that, but there are um, situations where they'll call for. Um, a generic term of herbs, like, oh, you want savory herbs in this, you want sweet herbs in this. And they are almost referenced as if they are just a, a, a known quantity or a known um, combination. And maybe that is per household. It's like, well, what, whatever sweet herbs that you normally use is sort of like what the recipe is saying when it says that. And, you know, a lot of our herbs come to us as 
a powdered ground up thing that's already, you know, it's like you could mix, you could make, you can and do, and you can buy simple herb mixes. Um, was it happening in the 18th century? Maybe. Um, was it done per household in their own special mix? Undoubtedly. Um, someone was asking, let me see if I can find it. Um, it was something along the lines of what's the, the oddest ingredient that you'll find in bread in the time period? Well, legally, okay, <laughs> there's, a, there's different kinds of breads, right? And there's the, the bread that is the regulated bread, which is regular loaf. They would have penny loaves and they would have half penny loaves and, you know, they'd have this kind of peasant bread. And those were, uh, the, these standard penny loaves and uh, manchet bread, they were the ones that were regulated. And the adulteration of bread, specifically what's happening in about 1740, somewhere in the 1740s, um, I think 1748, there's a, there's a big problem in Great Britain with wheat. Um, the, the year completely failed, the Thames froze over, uh, wheat went through the roof, and to combat that and the bad wheat that was available, they started adulterating it, and they would add a lot of things like chalk to it, um, calcium carbonate, and that would fluff it up. Uh, that would fix this kind of broken wheat, and so the people were so upset by that, and the other thing was... Um, alum was being added to bread, which is like, no way. Especially when you find out how they were making alum. It's like, I don't want that in my bread. So they were regulating the, the ingredients of bread and they said bread is only wheat, yeast, salt, water. You put anything else in it, you're breaking the law. They were doing that. And of course, don't, don't go right now and take your loaf of bread and look at what's in it because you'll find things like calcium carbonate and other items in your bread. Uh, adulterated it is. So that's what bread is. Um, so the other ingredients in bread are those specialty breads that weren't regulated. Um, so, you know, uh, breads that have milk in them and other sorts of ingredients. Yes, they were doing making those, but those are generally expensive specialty breads. And what would a baker do when they regulated the price of regular bread down too low? He wouldn't bake any. And he'd do all these other ones that weren't regulated. So it's like, well, I'm going to get more. I'm actually going to make money from this other bread. So I will stop making the cheap bread, which I don't make any money on or even lose money on. It's a pretty, pretty fascinating topic. It, it's massive. Yeah. And it's amazing. So get your pencil ready, John. Oh. I got a few uh, super chats. Okay. I'm ready. All right. Rob Maybe. Pool. Thank you. Are there still plans to do a canoe trip of some sort this year? How long will canoes typically last? Canoe. That's that's a pretty quick answer. I think we're want to do something. We will definitely, definitely. We're getting get in, those in the canoe. We we've made three of them. We have got to get no four of them. We have got to get them in the water. They're just uh, sitting. Poor things. Yeah. Um, how long will they last? Um, I would imagine, so, so I, I believe the, um, the tulip ones that we've made, or the tulip one that we made, uh, uh, tulip poplar, that is stored underwater, and I think you could probably get a decade or 15 years out of that before it gets too rotten, and they are amazing. Yeah. Other canoes out of other materials, are, some of them are very short-term. The uh, elm bark canoe, Hey, that might only last you a year or even just six or eight weeks, depending on how hard you use it and how long it stays wet and how it starts to break down. Um, and I have no idea on a birch bark canoe, you know, uh, again, it really depends. But if it's constantly being used, you have to constantly be repaired, repairing it. That's those voyeurs. They were voyeurs. They were, you know, canoeing all over. They'd stop for the night and somebody cook the food and somebody else would be fixing the, the yep. canoe. Pretty awesome. Yeah, we need to get those in the water. Yep. ASAP. All right. CDK, thank you. I've now spent more money on Townsend's mugs than I spend on coffee in a year. Keep them coming. Missed out on the blue one. Please restock it soon. A lot of people want that blue one. I Restocked. know. I know. That was a hit. And we'll, we've got some coming for Christmas, too. That'll be cool. They, those blue ones sold out by the time we came in in the morning <laughs> <laughs> from, the, from the live stream. Um, John Talley, thank you. 
What would be the most common wheat flour used in the 18th century? And what comparable product can we buy at the store today? And then Aaron Howitt, thank you. Have you heard the theory that fungus on bread caused mass hallucinations in Salem and were responsible for the witch trials? That's all I got right now. Good. Oh, um, there yes. was a John Snow. Welcome to the Nutmeg Tavern members. Oh, yeah. Remember, there's a new tainted brain emoji. Oh, and yeah. No old baby. And we got some more to, to we work got, on. Yeah, got apparently we, have more we can do like 20 more. We'll have to. Yeah, we got, we we're going to get cracking on that. We'll do a poll. Oh, everybody loves polls. a poll on what time. I love that. That's a good idea. Hill, Hilltown um, Gramers canoe trip. Thank you for the donation. Okay. Yes, you're good. OK, types of uh, flour. And I think he's trying to get to was there wheat or was there flour in that time period like what we would use today? Or if we wanted to emulate the flour of the time period, um, what's what's our best guess? So. Uh, I would say, and what I what I usually do is a go-to, and it depends on what you're baking, right? They're going to use different flours. They have all these different grades of flours, um, and they would, and it has to do in the time period with basically um, we ground the wheat, and this is, I mean, the the wheels are turning, they're pouring the wheat in, and you're going to get a whole bunch of some of the wheat is just cracked in half. And some of it's smooshed down pretty small. And some of it's ground ultra fine. And, and the bran comes off. And so you get all these different things when you grind it, especially with this type of grinding situation. So you send it through a series of sieves um, and or even bolting cloths. So they would have, you know, round tubes. They might have, you know, wheels with kind of a, you know, a, a a, um, or a open bin or open wheel that would have different sizes of mesh on the outside. So they'd send it down and they'd break it down and they'd say, I, you know, I want this, this fineness, that fineness until it got to the very, very finest at the very end that wouldn't go through the sieve. Uh, they might even have a silk sieve at the end. And then sometimes at the very end um, comes bran. Um, so they, they'd break this down so there's going to be inexpensive uh, parts of that and expensive parts. And they would take some of these bigger pieces and they'd send them back again. Um, and they would send them back again and again. And so they would have all these different grades of flour. So you could buy an expensive flour or expensive flour. Uh, so that's what's going on. If you want to emulate uh, the, the, the style of grain, that's a whole nother thing because the wheat that grew here in North America is different than the wheat that was growing in England at the time period and who knows what it was totally like. The guess is something like the, uh, the um, gluten content, not of the high glutens that we have today because they probably didn't have that. Uh, but all-purpose flour, which is sort of half and half, it's not pastry flour, it's not um, high gluten bread flour, and I would go with an unbleached, they weren't bleaching uh, their flour. So that would be where I'd go, uh, just as a generic, you know, um, typical flour of the time period. Ours is probably still way too fine, but you do what you can do. Uh, <laughs> next question. Boy. I gotta stop soon. Okay, this is it. Uh, the the uh, Salem thing. So that's real uh, that's Ergot real quick. on Rye. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Mark, NYC. Thank you for the donation. Thank you for the great content. Appreciate that. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Continue. They're all so talking yeah. About um, that right that there's an issue with Rye in the time period and Ergot, uh, which gets it's like a fungus or whatever it grows on Rye, doesn't grow on the other grains. It does make Rye, which is a less expensive grain semi-dangerous in that time period that there are times when it is bad, 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 and uh, the other grains are safer, which is kind of strange. And rye is one of those things that grows, I mean, and oh, there's so much. Oh, so so you've been talking for almost an hour on bread, and I feel like it's and like intro, it's like saying even, hello. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we haven't, haven't even, even scraped the topic. Um, but this book is a great one if you're interested in um, in what bread is like. It gives you some real hints again from their perspective. It's so. It, I mean, there's great research just been done. You know that we can look at what somebody in the 20th century or 21st century thinks about what 18th century bread was like. But this tells you what 18th century people were thinking what bread was like. Yep. I think, think we're good. Whew.
Hey, real quick, we will be streaming on Friday as well. This is just a special. We miss you all live stream. Yes, type, and type um, I'm gonna I'm gonna make myself do it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna commit to it and say, uh, Patreon people, watch for live stream tomorrow. Um, it's been um, it's been great to get back uh, to the Nutmeg Tavern. It's always a special time uh, that I can you know can talk to you guys and I hear uh, you know the comments and sometimes I get to go back and read them if I can and have the time and all that it's it's special uh that you guys are uh, reach out uh you help us out super chat patreon paypal um your comments you're sharing our videos all those things that make a massive difference in the kinds of videos we do the ability for us to make them and how many we do and how and the quality uh that we can afford to make so you guys make it happen Thank you so much for this wonderful live stream. I hope you have a great day and we'll see you again in the Nutmeg Tavern on Friday.